All right, here we go. Let's watch it. The world of riots and MMOs already done. This has been like the most requested video fucking reaction I've probably ever had. In the past, MMOs were regarded as the godfathers of games. They were the peak of what developers could accomplish. Even though, looking back, that's a fairly subjective thing to say. Everyone knew MMOs had the power to create cult following, but also everyone yeah. knew making MMOs was hard. On average, an MMO so has to, to spend at least six years in the baking before it can get anywhere near being good. Isn't but that sad? Like, you spend six years on a game and then it just, like, dies in two weeks? Like, I mean, whenever you really think about that, that's pretty fucking depressing, man. But that didn't stop companies from jumping onto the yeah, bandwagon anyway. And soon we could see dozens of new MMOs, wow. all releasing in 2008. Yep. All being called the WoW Killers. Did not Spoiler happen. alert, none of them did that. And unfortunately... Well, actually, there was a game that uh, that came out in 2008 that did end up being at least the beginning of the WoW Killers uh, that was uh, called Wrath of the Lich King. We can feel the ripple effects even now. It got to a point where every time a new MMO is announced, we all think the same thing. Oh. Anyway, when you're working on an MMO, you have to respect three pillars. Mm -hmm. Gameplay is king, social interactions matter, and the world setting is important. I think that's actually a really... This is like a, a very forehead way of explaining it, but I think this is actually perfect. This is a great list. Like, it, like I, I probably could not come up with a better top three. This is a very, very good way of saying it. When Riot announced their MMO, it became clear that two of the pillars are being respected, yeah. and the third one is already done. When it comes to the gameplay, it is currently in the hands of Ghostcrawler, someone who's been working on WoW during its best times, and True. someone who got a reputation for hate. To be fair, everybody hated Ghostcrawler whenever, in like, Mr. Pandaria, everybody hated him until he was gone, and then they're like, wait a minute, come back. Th that's the same with every single fucking person. Hating boomkins and loving mages. And when it comes to the source, S fan has like a personal vendetta against Ghostcrawler because Ghostcrawler one time said that paladins sucked and he wanted to like nerf paladins. Social interactions, it is a dance between the developers and the players. Yeah, he didn't like that the death one. can guide players towards social interactions. Yeah. Or they can annihilate them. And after that, the players usually find their own fun inside the MMO. From that point on, True. the devs should do everything in their power to support the players having fun in their own way. And finally, when it comes to the yeah, war- Yeah, that's why they added nor, uh, new new models for the worgen, so all the furries in the game can have their own kind of fun. And uh, yeah, I, I would say that like with, uh, with, with, with that game and uh, like with Final Fantasy, I think Final Fantasy does a much better job with social interactions. Like, just in general, I think Final Fantasy has less friction, so there's less negative social interactions. And it also has, like, more avenues to have positive ones, like housing and stuff like that. So, like, there's probably not that many people that are ERPing in WoW anymore because they've moved over to Final Fantasy. And can you blame them? world of an MMO, in Riot's case, it's done. And it's been finished for quite a few years now. In fact, the World of Riot's MMO is in such a good state, they already have the continents, the zones, the cultures, and wow. the races. And to a lesser degree, every zone already has its own storyline. Now, of this course, one. unless cool. you follow the lore of League of Legends, you wouldn't know about this. And Yeah, like, I don't know any of the lore of League at all. I, I have literally no idea. The only thing I know about League's lore is that there's, like, hot girls in, in the game. That's it. That's why I decided to make this video. I want to show you all the zones we are going to see in the MMO okay. and what sorts of quests we are going to do there. Let's so, see. for the purpose of this video, I will assume you have no idea what League of Legends is about. You have no all idea right. what the universe is about, but you like yes. MMOs, your hairline is receding, and you have a crippling fear of Nintendo 64 controllers. I don't know how I could be afraid of them. I've got one on my head. To which I might add, why do you think I'm wearing hats? But now, without further ado, Thank you. let's yep. have a look at there all you the go. zones. And, and that is so fucking true. Almost every guy, like, I don't, it's 
Fucking Keemstar is the worst one. He's been doing it longer than anybody. Oh, Keemstar always wears a hat? Yeah, why is that? In Riot's Tech MMO. Yep, Tekton's another one. Yep. This is Rune Terra, the world Summit? of no, League Sun of Legends. That's what makes right it now, the world is separated okay. into 10 cool. main regions. Yeah. But these 10 regions don't cover all the land on the map, so there are some mini zones mm -hmm. in between them. And the lore already revealed that there is gonna be another continent further to the east. That cool. definitely sounds like a future expansion to me. It's In lit. fact, it would be foolish to release all of these regions at launch. You can easily turn half of these into separate expansions. And because a lot of people already know and love these regions, the hype behind these expansions would be big. With that said, I know- That's actually a good idea. Yeah, I think the more that you kind of... Like, whenever WoW came out, for example, we knew there was the Outland, and we knew there was Northrend, and the game didn't come out with either one of those. Uh, and also Kazan, uh, the, the Goblin area. And uh, there were many other places in WoW that we didn't have access to, too. Uh, I just can't think of it in Warcraft, like a Grim Batal, for example. A lot of you would like Dragon to play Owl, yeah. as Shremans or Ionians. And now you may be cursing me for suggesting that these would be expansions. But... The lore can justify giving you these nations as playable races without having their regions. I'll show you how Riot can pull this off in a bit. First, let's talk about the regions Riot's MMO has to start with. The Northern Continent. This entire continent is called Valoran. Okay. Not Valorant, Valoran. And this is... I think I... It's not the same thing. But let's be honest, I think we know where they got the name from. Where the absolute core of this world is. The two main regions here are Demacia and Noxus. They are the two big rivals equivalent to the Horde and the Alliance. Okay. While I would like to say that Demacia is your classic normie human region, yes. it's not really true. Rune Terra doesn't really have a normal place. There is something cool happening in every region. Okay, and what does that Demacia mean? Demacia has racism. Okay, maybe not racism, because that sounds Demacia cool. doesn't mind yordles or minotaurs, but they really hate mages. That's because in the- Oh, so it's like America and science. Or the church, back in the day in, in Europe. Or actually, well, a lot of people hate science. Yeah, I mean, actually, I mean, to be fair, like- People fuck it everywhere. Like, that's, that shit happens in the Middle East, too. Like, we don't have a monopoly on, on that dumbass shit here in America. A, a lot of it happens everywhere else. But still, Past, that's the where we almost annihilated half of the world using magic. Yeah, so of course they don't like majors. Fucking duh. And so, Demacia was built inside a magic-absorbing forest. Okay. Therefore, Demacia is a really cool place where you can hide from magic. When it comes to the visuals of the zone, you can see a lot of lush fields, okay. it is surrounded by mountains, but the iconic part of the Masia are the buildings. They are made of petricite, which is a combination of stone and the magic-absorbing wood. Because these ancient magic-absorbing trees were grey, all the buildings have a marble-like appearance. And yes, given what material they are using, all the buildings in the Masia also absorb magic. So should a mage visit this region, Let's just say it's gonna be a painful experience. On top of this, let's not forget that Demacians can weaponize Petricite. They can turn it into Petricite Steel, which gives you your classic anti-magic weapons. That's badass. And you can sculpt Petricite Constructs, which wake up after absorbing magic. Simply said- That's r what the fuck? This is actually really cool. I didn't know any of this. And these guys just really wow. don't like magic. The irony is, they've been absorbing it for years now. And this is where the story would kick in. You see, the Masians are so afraid of magic, they founded the Mage Seeker Order. This is an order of people who hunt mages, they throw them in the prison, and they torture them until their body gives up on magic. So yes, okay. being a mage yep. is a crime in the Masia. The thing I, I like that a lot, I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I think that's fucking badass. Like, I, I love it whenever they have... It's like, obviously, there is, like, a, a level of uh, real-life parallel that something like this has. And I really like how, like, in certain games, they're able to, like, capture that real-life parallel 
and not have it be this like weird lampooned like one-sided version where it's like this guy's just evil and and that's all there is to it like actually making it to be complex and interesting i think that the the, the best example is like like final fantasy does this very well with like having the two sides of a conflict not necessarily be like one side is evil one side is good i think that's cool is people still get naturally born with magical abilities you can't stop it from happening so not yeah. only are there mages hiding in the royal court right now there is a there mage is war, civil like war yeah, happening smart. in the masia where mages and people who don't hate mages rise up to fight for moral rights so should we do some quests in this zone this is gonna be the core story yeah this mages is great. trying to overthrow racist leadership following old laws so the main enemy NPCs might be mages and witches. But I know what you're thinking now, and don't worry. There will be plenty of boars to kill here too. Or at least there are loads of wolves here, as well as stags. And we can't forget the icon- I don't think that they always have to make- and I, I hope that this isn't the case. I think that it's okay to have some areas and some races that are just morally wrong. Like, I, I don't think that, like, every end of every story should be that the good guys always win. Because I think that it, it, it becomes predictable and boring. Like, you need to have um, the Empire Strikes Back. You have to have those. Sonic Demacian Raptors. But further to the south, yeah, we yeah. might find some crag beasts, tiny woolly elephants, Ooh. and yes... Of course, in the Argent Mountains, there are also dragons. Uh, uh, I love the art here. I think that the art's very, um, uh, it, it, it's very, like, quintessential fantasy. I like that a lot. Loads and loads of dragons. Yeah, that's fucking badass. But that's badass. about it for Demacia. Fun fact, the capital city of Demacia is called the Great City of Demacia. Sounds dumb, but Runeterra was not the first one to come up with this. But thankfully, True. the other regions are a bit more creative with their names. So now, let's move away from the normal okay. region and let's have a look at the badass region, Noxus. If you're planning on playing a warrior with oversized weapons and overcompensating lush hair, this is the region for you. This place actually has a long right. and badass history, but okay. we really what don't have the time to explain it now. Right. So just know that originally it was built by the most badass warrior in the history of Runeterra. All right, this awesome. motherfucker literally died on a mountain of corpses. And after he died, he was too angry to stay dead, so he just became the god of the underworld. When this guy lived, he built the Immortal Bastion which is Holy to this shit. day the largest structure on the entirety of Runeterra. And currently he is banished underneath the Immortal Bastion, but only a few people know about it. So, you know, that's a future raid boss. Anyway, the Immortal Bastion is the capital city of the Noxian Empire. That's really, really with cool. With Noxus being one of the most brutal nations in Runeterra. It is brutal because the nation is surrounded by rocky earth. It is hard to grow plants here. So Noxians are forced into conquering surrounding land for resources to survive. All right. That's why when you go yeah. to the map, you can notice that the Noxian territory is all over the place. Hell it's yeah. It's because these are all the places Noxus has already conquered. Goddamn right. Although, when I say it like that, you may imagine Noxus brutally raiding everything. Yes. But that's not true. They like to absorb the surrounding nations into their empire. After all, it's just more human resources. Most like of Rome? the time, they okay. only remove the royalty and they let the leaderless people join their empire. And that's because Noxus values strength above all. And I like this. This is cool. Yeah, again, I think it's super, super, super good to have different types of uh, these like races and factions. I just, I don't like how, like, in WoW, there's, like, not a lot of moral ambiguity in the game. I think it makes it kind of boring. I liked how the Forsaken in, like, vanilla WoW, even Sylvanas says, like, yo, we're not really with the Horde. Like, we don't give a fuck about them. We're just out for ourselves, and we just like killing people, and this is what we do. And so that's it, right? Like, Garrosh, yeah, exactly. Like, wow, wow, used to have moral ambiguities. Yeah, it's like, I don't know why. It's like people, maybe it's like writers and like the people in the, um, 
uh, that like make these stories they feel like the moral ambiguities have like real life parallels and they're like enabling people that agree with the real life parallels like I, 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 I don't know. I, I think it's very silly and childish, personally. I, I love to have, you know, actual morally gray things. Rulers tend to not be good fighters. This is what you can see in the After Victory cinematic. They kill the king because he was weak and let everyone else join them. Fun fact, conquering nations is so iconic for Noxus, they have their own saying. Kill them until they are family. So when it comes to the All quests right. in Noxus, it is most likely going to be helping the Empire expand its territory. Although, this region has Fuck its own yeah. unique enemies too. Inside the Immortal Bastion, there is a cult known as the Black Rose. This cult is connected to the darkest of magics. So be ready to fight Hemomancers, Witches, Demons and the Grey Legion. Which is an okay. army of soldiers revived with blood magic to fight for the Empire again. And when it comes to collecting 10 bear asses, here we have the native Drakehounds and Basilisks. Now, while Noxus That's really and Demacia cool. are the main rivals here, both of them are also constantly repelling raids from the north. So now, let's have a look at the Freljord. Just like pretty much any region on Runeterra, Freljord has a long history. Okay. But for the purpose of this video, just know that the maddening old gods known as the Watchers of the Void, who want to devour the entire reality only because it keeps waking them up, once tried to breach into reality here. They almost succeeded because they tricked the Ice Witch Lysandra into helping them. Fortunately, she realized how wrong she was, and she managed to freeze half of the kingdom with the Watchers still beneath them. So these days, the Ice Witch is the only person holding back the end of reality by keeping the Watchers frozen. That's- that's fucking cool. God damn, yeah. Sounds familiar? Yeah, yeah, it, this is, a uh, uh, fucking, uh, Ashara. In- in WoW. Kind of. So at some point in the future, you bet one of these woken up frozen Watchers is gonna be a raid boss. Now, when it comes to the NPCs, this is where things get diverse. First of all, remember that the Freljord is brutally cruel. Everything is frozen and survival is everything. So the first enemy here would be the wildlife. From Rhymefangs to Yetis to okay. Druvasks to Elnix to Mammoths to the worst of them all, Poros. Next we are going oh, to fight the Freljordians like themselves. Animals, right? There are three main tribes here. The Avarosans, who are quite peaceful, the Wintersclaw, who are quite yeah. brutal, and the Frostguard, Lysandra's followers who hold back the Watchers. And let me tell you, these guys have some badass armor. Among the notable yeah, tribes, cool. there are also the Ursine, which are shamans who worship the Volibear, the primal god of the wild who slowly turns his worshippers into twisted animalistic monstrosities. That's cool. Speaking of which, yes, there are also the primal gods of Freljord. And finally, we need to talk about the Iceborn. When the Watchers tried to arrive here, they tainted the ice around them. This special ice is called the True Ice. And it is so dangerous, you literally die if you touch it. However, the Watchers also tainted some people, giving them the ability to touch the ice. It is still extremely painful for them to hold a true ice weapon, but at least they can survive it. These people That's are known cool. as the Iceborn. But people were not the only things that were tainted. There are also Ice Trolls, some of whom are also Iceborn. To be honest, these guys were made to have their own dungeon. Yeah, 100%. I mean, obviously, that's what they were for. I mean, shit. Like, I mean, I think this all this stuff looks really, really cool, man. Like, this looks really, really fucking cool. I like it a lot. But there are also some animals that were the twisted by the Watchers. Yeah, and Lysandra is even twisting some beings herself to make them serve her. So overall, Freljord is gonna have a lot of cool warriors, shamans, and yep. horrors. So these would be the three regions on the main continent. But this place is actually so big it can easily make the base world of the game. Especially since Jesus. there are a bunch of smaller regions in between okay, them. So this would be like there the is main... Nokberg yeah, I see full it. of witches, Argent Mountains with their dragons, Tokugol with void monsters, Dalamore Plains with... him? 
and so much more. But from here, you can cleverly set up the expansions because of how well everything is interconnected. Okay. So now, let's have a look at the continent to the east called Ionia. Ionia has a very close connection to Noxus. You can only guess Makes why. Sense next to it. It's because Noxians once tried to conquer it all during an event simply called the Invasion of Ionia. This was a horrible war full of using children as soldiers because Noxians thought Ionians wouldn't fight back against children. And I love this. Like, this is what WoW used to have. It used to have absolutely fucking horrible, brutal shit. And they weren't afraid to do it. Like, if you go back to, like, Warcraft 2 and, like, Warcraft 3 and some of the books back then, like, bro, absolutely fucking savage, brutal, terrible things. Way more interesting. And chemical weapons. And yeah, look at the lots old and lots of chemical art. weapons. Speaking of which, remember Singed from Arcane? He's the guy who chemically devastated Ionia. Eventually, Noxus wow. failed, but they kept their small controlled territories. So the first quest here could be simply boarding a ship, sailing over, and exploring the place for the Noxian Empire. Now, when it comes to Ionia itself, the place <laughs> gets mystical. Everything here is alive and connected to the spirit of nature. Okay. And I mean everything, from the animals to the people to the buildings. Everything is alive. So if you anger Mother Nature, your house can twist and strangle you in your sleep. I like so that. you can only cool. imagine how Mother Nature fought against Noxians. Usually a river came alive to drown them. That's why like all the, the buildings style. here look like they were woven from wood. It's because they were. With nature magic, people let nature build their houses. It also means that sometimes your house can just walk away. When it comes to the NPCs the here, goes. obviously there is too. gonna be a lot of nature spirits. And a lot more of simply mystical animals. From giant flying tigers to the never-ending story. But be ready to also face lo flying tigers to the never-ending I love shit like this, dude. I think this is so fucking badass, man. That is so cool. ...story. But be ready to also face local Ionians, Blade Masters, Shadow Cultists, okay. Murderers, and Ninjas. Both good, bad, and the in-between. But finally, like there's also one more enemy that we could face. The Furries. What? That's right. This race is known as the Vastaya. They are half Wait, humans and Legends? half magical animals. And yes, canonically, the species was born in exactly the way you are thinking. Okay. But to be fair, the Vastaya are quite cool and they are definitely gonna be a playable race. Just like Yordles, who also like Ionia a lot. Lastly, after Noxians ravaged Mother Nature, demons started occupying all the places filled with misery and doubt. So that's gonna be a nice bonus enemy. I remember watching so this. So yes, the exploration of Ionia and the raid on the Shadow Order could be a really cool first expansion. But it's definitely that's not cool. Riot's only option because we can also go south to Piltover and Zone. These are the ones people will know about simply because this is where Arcane took place. Piltover and Zone are two massive so this cities is the city. located one above the other. Okay. And they are so massive they could easily be turned into their own playable zones. They are both focusing on futuristic technology powered up by magic of the Hextech gemstones. Using this magic, they can power up anything from guns to augmented limbs to That's cool. vehicles. Visually, it is simply futuristic Victorian era. So it's steampunk. Okay, great. Yeah, people love that shit. And unfortunately, there wouldn't be much of enemy variety. We would likely fight the rich houses of Piltover and their deadly assassins, with the occasional thief on the streets, corrupt wardens, okay. and the occasional rogue steam golem. But things get a bit more interesting in the undercity known as Zone. Zone is the dirty underbelly covered in thick toxic smoke. Because the majority of people are poor here, they developed a cheaper alternative to Hextech called Chemtech. This artificial green stuff can power up cheaper limb replacements, as well as highly unstable weaponry. Zone is also controlled by the Cam Barons, which are obviously gonna be the main enemy here. But on the side, we may also meet some chemical mutants, unstable constructs, as well as some mass murderers and people who hunt down mass murderers. 
And funnily enough, at the very, very bottom that's, of Zorn that's cool. itself, there are the hidden ruins of an ancient city full of traps. That is obviously going to be a cool dungeon. Yeah, so I, I, I honestly think this, this is very, very promising. I thought there were just like a few different zones. I didn't realize that it was so in-depth. Like, I, I thought there was like some lore to it, but it was like... Uh, yeah, like these are like the guys over here and the guys over there. Like I, I didn't know it was this complex. This is crazy. Oh yes, there is not much more that I can add here. Built over and zone were simply explored in Arcane. So if you like the series, you uh -huh. are gonna like this place. It's 13 From years here, of we can yeah, travel so. further south to Shurima. Shurima used to be a massive empire that ruled the world. But after the Emperor got betrayed by his best friend, the entire empire collapsed. This region is a massive desert with the occasional city near a river. In the center of the region there is the Sun Disk, a colossal piece of star metal that has the power to reflect celestial magic. The Shurimans use this celestial magic to turn their best soldiers into the Ascendant, also known okay. as the Golden God Warriors. However, so these god warriors wouldn't make a great enemy here. That's because after the emperor had died, the ascended started fighting for leadership. And slowly, after learning how to use blood magic to gain the edge, they morphed their own bodies and became the Darkin. Twisted, blood frenzied monsters that would certainly make really cool raid bosses. That's cool. Besides this ancient evil, Shurima is also full of its own animals. Raiders. Dune scavengers, and on top of all of that, void creatures. That's because to the south there used to be a kingdom known as Ikathia that wanted to destroy the Shuriman Empire. So they asked the Watchers for help. Aren't they you can all the way up there though? That went. The Watchers sent through some void beasts that consumed Ikathia and polluted Shurima to this day. Oh, to fuck. fight back the void, Shurima does have a lot of hidden tombs around with hidden god warrior weapons. Not to mention that Shurima also has a circle of time mages who are trying to freeze the void in time. Now, as I mentioned near the beginning of the video, even if Shurima becomes an expansion, they can still easily make Shurimans a playable race because they are already connected to Noxus. As you can see, of course, Noxians already conquered part of Shurima. Yeah. So some Shurimans are fighting for Noxus. That makes sense. Also, as a cool fact, for those of you who liked Arcane, Hex Crystals are harvested in Shurima. That's why a Shuriman expansion would be a great follow-up to Piltover and Zone. And again, that's why Riot can easily turn only the Northern Continent into the base world. Anyway, going west from Shurima, we arrive at Mount Targon. This that's crazy, like, holy fucking shit, that's like, oh my god, I, like, it's, it, I'm like, I'm just pausing it just to like, take everything in. This is a, a lot, like, 12 years of world building, I know, well, the, the crazy thing about this is like, this is kind of what happened with WoW, is that you had all the world building of Warcraft 1 through 3, you had all the books that were written about it, too. And then, you know, there's a couple of other, like, you know, secondary games. It wasn't really that big of a deal, though. And, 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 like, that's what made the foundation for WoW so strong. So, like, I'm seeing the same thing here. Place is incredibly unique. First of all, this mountain is not natural. It was literally pulled up from the ground by celestial gods. And that's because this place serves as a portal to the Celestial Realm, also known as Targon Prime. Now, because this mountain was pulled up, it also has some unique features. Okay. For example, you may find frozen lakes frozen horizontally on the mountain. And the very peak of the mountain yeah. is special too. Should a mortal reach the peak despite the brutal climate and the deadly wildlife, either they die from exhaustion, or the celestial gods deem them worthy and they become an ascended aspect. There is aspect of war, aspect of the sun, aspect of the moon, aspect of the twilight, aspect of the guardian, and so on. Simply said, after people reach the peak, they become some of the strongest beings on the entire planet. Holy so shit. of course, the mountain is full of people who worship the celestial demigods. And I speculate this is where we could get a lot of cool armor sets. 
There yeah, are we'll the Solari, who are devoted to the aspect of the sun. Then there are the rivals, the Lunari, who are devoted to the aspect of the moon. But also the tribe, I assume, will become a playable class, the Warriors of Rakor. All right. Of course, besides just humans, Targon also has all sorts of furry Vastaya. Near the bottom of the mountain, you may notice that the mountain is alive. But also there are Stellar Corns, a variety of mind-bending creatures and loads and loads of dragons. Speaking of which, remember that this place is linked to the Celestial Realm. So this is where we may also meet the star-forging Celestial Dragon Aurelian Soul. Oh my god! So this is like, this is fucking straight up, like, Bloodborne, Cosmic Horror, Lovecraft level gods. It, it's not like in WoW where there's like a god, but it turns out that it's a robot for example. As well as all sorts of other celestial beings. A lot of these would make for interesting bosses. Yeah. In fact, the ascension of Mount Targon would be a really cool raid. Next, on the other side of Shurima, there is Ishtal. This is a special place where people are mastering the elemental magic. They are using it for everything. Fishing, smithing, walking. And this place is definitely gonna be saved for an expansion. Okay. Basically, remember when Ikathian asked the Watchers for help? And then that happened? Ishtal Seems was like their a bad neighbor, time. and after they saw the Void devour an entire kingdom, they believed the Void would soon devour the entire world. Makes so, sense. So, using their elemental magic, Ishtal built massive walls of plants around their entire region, isolating themselves from the rest of the world. For three and a half thousand years, Ishtal stayed isolated, believing that the world outside of their walls was devoured by the void. But now, very recently, some mages found out that the world outside is completely fine. So now, the Ishtali mages are slowly revealing themselves. Okay, to be that's honest, interesting. Ishtal is the most underdeveloped region in Runeterra. We know the region has a lot of hunting Vastaya, deadly plants and some elemental dragons, but most of the region is still a mystery to us. So at least here, Riot will have the freedom to try something new. I think what I like about this too is the fact that a lot of the storylines for this kind of stuff, like, they're not immediately, like, derivative of something else at a one-to-one -one level. Like, you have obviously the Rome thing, the kill them until their family. Like, but that's the people have done that. Like, it's Alexander the Great did that. Like, uh, Persia did that. Like, uh, there's plenty of other times that that's happened. Uh, so it, it's, it's hard to really, like, say that's one specific thing. But, like, in, in general, I, I like it because it is inside of, like, the meta narrative of a lot of these different places. You can see how there is a. Uh, like a looming power conflict or some sort of power struggle or some sort of battle of morality or something like that inside of them, w which makes it interesting. But now we leave the main continent to visit the last two Political regions. Entry, yeah. First of all, there is Bilgewater. If you like pirate adventures, this is gonna be your place. That's it, yep. This is where we are going to explore inns and gambling dens, even oh. some local temples worshipping the god of motion, Nagake Boros. Here we are going to fight pirates mm. and sea monsters, sea witches, sea vastaya, maybe some demons. And possibly we'll side with Sarah Fortune to fight the king of the pirates, Gangplank. But okay. there's a lot more here. Last year, Riot released their RPG, which was set in Bilgewater. So not only can we oh, already yeah. explore this place in detail, but it even has a monster journal. Wow. And at a quick glance, you can already see some really cool bosses too. However, this place is also linked to the last place I want to show you today. Okay, what the is Shadow it? The Shadow Isles. See, every year the horrors of the Shadow Isles lurk out. And Bilgewater just happens to be the closest place. So every year, Bilgewater is fighting the undead. Once upon a time, the Shadow Isles used to be the Blessed Isles, a rich place full of advanced magic. Long story short, there was a young asshole king who wanted to revive his dead queen. And in the process, he accidentally released dark necromantic magic. This magic uh. destroyed the island and made it home for undeath. 
In the lore, this event is called the Ruination. And because the yep. RPG is called Classic. the Ruined King, it may not be a surprise to you that you also get to explore the Shadow Wilds there. And there they have anything you can imagine. Undead horrors creeping everywhere. And That's should cool. we ever venture into these islands? I have no idea whom we're going to fight. The Ruined King who caused all of this is banished elsewhere. Thresh, who siphoned his magic after he was banished, also left the Isles. And even Hecarim, the most brutal soldier of them all, is currently around Demacia. So the Shadow Isles don't currently have a main baddie. So this is where Riot could push forward some of the side characters. Yeah, that's now, a good idea. even though these have all been the regions that are currently set up on Runeterra, Riot... I also don't think it's a bad idea to add in new characters. Like... The, the problem that WoW had for a long time, and I think it, it, this is less of a problem now, but it was for a while, is that almost all of the main characters in WoW were from Warcraft 3. And, like, the actual game, World of Warcraft, did a generally bad job at developing new characters to, like, go along with them. So, like, yeah, you, you like, recently, yeah, you've had things like Denathrius. Like, uh, Denathrius and Lee Shin are two examples like Lee Shin was in one patch fucking resurrected and he is a fucking badass everybody loved him like he came out of nowhere in the lore they're like yeah by the way there's the Thunder King uh, Denathrius the same thing it, it was it, I, I don't think you need to have every character be a uh, you, you know a pretty established thing has already confirmed that there is a new continent further to the east Currently, it is planned to be revealed in the upcoming Ruination novel. And so far, we know that this new continent is where the ruined King Viego is from. And this is also where he was banished at the end of his story. All we know about that place is that it is quite mystical. There are yet more dragons here. And in fact, Kamavor, which is the ruined King's nation, has a lot of draconic armor. That's so should cool. Riot run out of places to explore, don't worry, they can always make up more. But yeah, yeah, that's all I that wanted way. to show you today. As someone who's been following the lore of League of Legends from the very beginning, I can tell you, I'm very confident the setting of Riot's MMO is gonna be great. Their incredible writers have been preparing the world for years now. And now, it's time to harvest the fruit. If you like this video, let me know in the comments below. Because right now, I still have three more topics that I could talk about in regards to the MMO. I especially want to talk about the potential raid bosses we can face, yeah. and the potential classes we could play. And as someone who has collected an unholy amount of transmog, I would love to show you all the cool armor sets this yeah. universe has. Yeah, I want to see that. that's it for this video. See you in six to eight years when the MMO gets released. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it'll come out after Ashes of Creation. I actually don't think it's as far away as people might believe. I, I, I don't I don't think so. I mean, they probably wouldn't announce it. Like, I think it'll probably come out in two years. Probably two to three years, somewhere around there. That That's what I would guess. Well, people have asked me to watch this ever since it came out, uh, what, almost like two or three weeks ago. And uh, the video certainly didn't disappoint, man. I think this is fucking awesome. Like, as I said, I think that the best thing about this, in my mind, is the fact that the writers are not afraid to tell stories of, uh, of actual morally gray actions. I think this is something that doesn't happen enough in storytelling nowadays, where it's like, the good guys always win, you know, what a surprise, and it's just boring. Uh, I think that the reason why I thought in uh, if fucking Infinity War was so good, spoiler alert, Thanos wins. He just fucking beats the shit out of all of them and there's nothing they can do. It was awesome. And it was the same thing with Empire Strikes Back. And, and like, it's, it's not about the whole thing in part one. Yeah, well, that's what really matters. I, I mean, like, that could exist on its own. And so, Endgame was trash. I didn't like Endgame a lot either. I, th I thought it was a departure. But, um, but the point is that I think that it's like if you have the, uh, what's the word for it? If you have the, the confidence to write a story that way, 
I, I will feel much more confident that the writing that you're doing and like the stories you're telling will be much more interesting and compelling. Uh, I think the reason why stories like uh, and and there's no reason why like a pure evil and pure good story can't exist. You have things like Lord of the Rings. You have things like JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Dio is a villain, and that's all there is to it. Uh, and they're they're great. They're incredible. But and there's also the um, you know Void Lords and uh, you know the Lovecraftian horrors. I'm pretty sure the uh, the Void Lords. There's no real. Uh, uh, there's you know there's no real side of their story you know it's, they don't have like really a side of the story it's just they are fucking annoyed that people are here and that's all there is to it right so I, I think obviously there's a lot of uh, th there's a lot of examples of this that, that that's out there berserk um, I, I think berserk is actually a, a different example I think uh, you, you know like berserk how uh, you know Griffith is doing all these evil things and nobody knows about it because like Falconia is like a uh, fucking like whatever you want to call it like it's a it's a utopia right it's a paradise but only only like guts and Costco and a few other people even know that like what what Griffith really is like I, I think that that's also like a very very compelling and interesting story uh, and that that's what I'm really saying sick of seeing movies or games where always the good boys wins well I don't think it's it's really that simple but I think it's also, especially in an MMO, whenever you're telling a story, because like a lot of these stories are told in like a medieval, it's like a medieval setting, right? Or like a medieval fantasy setting, which is generally what this is. Like there's not a lot of guns in here. Uh, while there are like steampunk type things, that's not really the main, uh, you know, function. Uh, and that's it. So in that scope, like what happened in the Middle Ages? Well, you had people getting burned alive for being witches. Uh, they burned Joan of Arc alive, for example. Um, you have slavery. You have uh, absolute fucking unchecked, unrepentant colonialism and just conquest and brutality that you can't even fucking imagine. And, yeah, there weren't any guns. Yeah, like, real fucking insane shit, right? And that's what I think is so compelling about, uh, you know, it used to be compelling about WoW because you could see the good and the evil and you could see the evil and the good. And that's why I was so excited about Shadowlands. I don't want to go off on a WoW tangent here. I was so excited about Shadowlands whenever they started telling the story of the Kyrian and the Arbiter and, like, the path in that way where you see the evil inside of the good. And it's like, wow, this is so cool. And it just never really got realized. And I, I hope that they can do that here, too. I think that WoW's story has gotten too safe. That's why I think that characters like... Uh, Garrosh were perfect. Like that, that's one of my favorite characters. They're amazing, and and I hope that uh, the League of Legends uh, MMO or Riot MMO uh, follows that same paradigm. Yeah, I I fucking love that man. And uh, let, let's see here. I hope you watch Arcane. Yeah, I haven't watched Arcane at all. Uh, let's see, Madan's best character. Uh, yeah, sure. And um, which which has the hottest girls? I don't know. I mean, there's. I mean, I feel like every League of Legends character is hot. I mean, like, why do you think they, like, I mean, if it's not hot, then why are they gonna have like ten different fucking costumes and like made costumes for them? I mean, l let's be real. You ever watch the League cinematics? I might watch them whenever uh, you know more news about this comes out, and I can look at it myself. Yeah. Uh, I haven't watched all of Arcane, bro. I I just I hope that the uh, I hope it's good. I mean, it, I think this is like one of those situations where it's like everything is in there in like they have everything. They have everything that they need to succeed. Right. They have a tremendous, massive existing fan base. They have a apparently gigantic fucking world that I didn't even really know, like 95 percent of uh, they have a, a amount like a, it's a huge company. So because it's a huge company, they can uh, spend a tremendous amount of money. Uh, they don't have a history of games that have pay to win in them. So it's like every single time, like, you know, one of these games comes out, that's what people worry about. And it seems like, you know, they, they, have, the, uh, they have the foundation, they have the resources, uh, and also, like, they have proven success, too. Valorant is a great game. League of Legends is a great game. Everybody hates League of Legends, but they, they still play it. So it's like, I, I feel like they, they've made a number of very, very good games, and they've kept up with those good games.
And so they, they don't have a balanced team. That's what you think. See, you don't – you think they don't have a balanced team, but you don't understand what their balanced team is trying to do. Their balanced team is not trying to make all the champions perfectly balanced against each other. They're trying to switch it up regularly to make the game, you know, more dynamic. That's what every uh, every game does. I mean, it's the same thing with WoW. and Yeah, they shift metas constantly. That, that It's not – perfectly balanced on purpose you gonna actually play the game and just watch it uh, i don't know i mean like i uh i'll play this game whenever it comes out for sure man absolutely